Kira Kodo, everyone. Hopefully uh, everyone can hear. Um, there's a few people just still connecting in. Um, I'm Fiona McDonald. I'm the EOTC support and advice lead for EONS. And um, Catherine uh, oh, has popped back in now. We're having a, a few technical issues um, this afternoon. Catherine, are you right to manage admitting people as they arrive? Um, yes, I'll just um, open up that screen and I'll keep doing that. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Right, so um, we'll get started on the Zoom for today around creating and using standard operating procedures or SOPs. Uh, and um, I'll jump in and out of the slideshow a couple of times as well during the session. Um, but if for most of the session, if you can um, just stay on mute, that would be great. Um, and you can either use um, the chat function to ask questions or um, we'll have breaks during the session and at the end of the session um, to answer questions as well. Before we kick off, um, a really important thing that we EONS is really trying to push this year is to make sure that we have as many schools as possible on the National EOTC Coordinated Database. Um, you're probably already on there and that's probably how you found yourself in this Zoom, um, but you can check um, by following the uh, orange button on the EONS website, and we'll have a look at that later. And we really would appreciate your support in trying to get your neighboring school um, on board with the database as well, and any networks that you have. Yeah. Fiona, can, yeah. I just, can I just add to that? Over time, um, administrating that space, I, every now and again, I might get a school that unsubscribes and I tend to go back to them and I explain that while at face value, if the office is getting that information, then they're probably not the right people to decide whether in fact that's relevant. But the important part is that somebody pays a second of attention to the email and acts where appropriate. And that's the most important thing. And it might be, oh, this doesn't apply to me or that doesn't apply to me. One day, there'll be something in there that really does apply. And if you don't know, you don't know. So hence the importance of actually staying there and just spending the moment it takes to scan through to make those decisions. And that's something that, you know, is a really good message to pass on to other schools. Cool. So thanks, for that. thanks, Catherine. Uh, so the overarching key messages for this whole Zoom series have been uh, these three that are up on the slide now. Um, the first one is really about understanding why you're doing what you're doing and understanding the procedures you're using to do that. Uh, the second point is ensuring that what you're doing is current um, or doing the same job as the current tools are. And I'll show you um, at the end of the slideshow where those current tools sit on EONS' website so that you can do that check. And the third point there is ensuring that everyone understands what they're meant to be doing and that they have the skills and knowledge to be able to do it. And um, the competency there of the staff uh, running the events is really the, the absolute key to making sure things run smoothly. Uh, so what are standard operating procedures? Um, they're a document that describes how you'll run a particular activity. And they cover a whole range of things that you can see there. Um, we're going to have a look at an example one later on and you'll see the different categories of things that might sit within standard operating procedures. Um, why would you use standard operating procedures? They're a really good way of ensuring um, consistency of delivery, uh, particularly when you've got multiple teachers doing the same activity. Um, they reduce down the 
um, amount of, or the perception of the amount of paperwork that might be needed needed to be done for a particular activity. And they certainly allow um, and encourage the low risk EOTC opportunities because they provide a really good um, scaffolding for teachers to see that they can get out there easily and quickly. Uh, when? Okay. Um, You'd use or develop standard operating procedures where you have a group of like activities. So for example, um, the example I'm gonna show you today is from a local primary school where they regularly visit three very local areas um, and do similar things at those local areas. Uh, we have a single activity that might be led by a whole range of different teachers and you can get a good consistency um, by having a standard operating procedure in place. Um, so an example might be a trip that goes to the museum um, where every class goes separately with a different teacher, but you want them all to have the same experience. Um, so standard operating procedures can allow that to happen. And the other example is where an activity happens regularly. Um, swimming lessons are a good example here where the same teacher might take the class once a week for five weeks, and that happens across all the classes. Um, so if you had the teacher doing all of the planning, or each teacher doing all of the planning, then it's quite a load on those teachers, but a standard operating procedure can really um, create some efficiencies in that space. Uh, so we'll look at now at the development process and how you get to create standard operating procedures. But first of all, I'll just have a quick pause there and see if there's any questions um, on those first couple of a slides about what standard operating procedures are and why and where you'd use them. Are there any questions in the chat, Catherine? Sorry, no, not, not, not yet, Fiona, a right. few ways. Thank you. All right, so I'm just gonna stop sharing this screen and start sharing another one. So when we're developing standard operating procedures, um, we start uh, by doing a risk assessment for those activities. And uh, in this case, I've used uh, form two out of the toolkit, the EOTC risk assessment and supervision form. Um, this is the latest version of uh, what used to be a RAMS form or a um, SAP form. And so this is the most current one. Um, if your forms uh, don't look like this, then I encourage you to go off into the toolkit and I'll show you where that is later on the EON site and look at the different things that this form does. Um, I've done a Zoom um, session on using this form before. Um, it's sitting as a recording. So if anything, if, if this doesn't look familiar or using it um, isn't familiar, then um, that would be a great place to start. And um, watch that and then you can flick me questions as well. I'm happy to help um, increase the understanding about how to use this form. So here um, I've identified that I'm looking at local learning activities and in this case um, it's primary school, uh, 500 metres maximum walking to three different areas. And I just go through a general risk assessment process where I'm looking at what could go wrong, and there's a whole list of things down the side here um, that could go wrong. What would cause that to happen? And then how serious is that? And this first risk rating um, is without any controls in place. Um, so if I was just to stand at the classroom door and say, see it, well, off to the park you go, come back in an hour, new entrance. Um, 
you know, there's a there's a high risk involved in that kind of strategy. Um, we're not going to do that. We're going to put some controls in place uh, for managing this activity. A um, couple of points to note in here. Uh, there's controls that are put in place at an organisational level, um, and then there's controls that are put in place um, by the leader or the teacher in charge, and not in this particular one, but there's also um, controls that are put in place by the participant. So you might end up with three categories here. Um, in this case, I've got two. Um, after each control, there's a little M, and in some cases, there's a little E for eliminate or minimize. And most of your controls will be minimize. Um, uh, an example of an eliminate control here would be uh, we're going out the back gate to the park, we're not going near any roads. So we would be eliminating um, a collision with a vehicle because we're not going near a road. Um, that's not the case here, so there's no ease in here. Then I have a look at who's going to be in charge of that. And then finally, I consider what's the residual risk, the risk left over or the level of risk left over after these controls are put in place. Um, and you can see that Without any controls, I'm thinking that's a high risk. With controls, I'm thinking it comes down to a medium risk. And there's a whole um, matrix and explanation that sits behind this um, that you can see in the other Zoom. So I just work through that process, identifying um, all the things that could cause harm, the hazard that would cause them, the initial rating, the controls, and then the residual rating at the end. You can see here, um, here's an example of um, an elimination strategy. We're avoiding those things altogether. So it's an elimination compared to a minimization strategy. Um, it continues on, lots of things to consider there. And I'm basically working through the whole risk assessment process for that activity. going on down, once I've done that, I move down to the next part of that planning template in form two. Now these things I'm not going to fill in uh, in this development process because these are particular to the day and the group of students that are going on the activity. One thing that is good to consider here is if you've had any past incidents at those particular places, and what learnings are there? And have you taken those learnings into account when you've developed the uh, controls up in this column here? Okay, so learnings are important. Are they in your controls now that you've learned them? The next part to look at is the supervision requirements. And at this stage, because I'm developing this generically, I'm not thinking about particular people, but I am thinking about the roles and the competencies that are required for that type of event. Um, so I'm gonna need a person in charge. Um, I want that person in charge to be a teacher. Therefore, they're gonna have a police check. Uh, their group management skills, they're a te trained teacher, so that's gonna tick that box. Over in this last column, I'm thinking about what induction or training that particular role will need to safely run that activity. Um, in this case, for the person in charge, they're gonna to need to know a little bit about how the safety management, uh, sorry, um, the safety management system overall works, the EOT safety management plan, and they're going to have to be, uh, they're going to have to know about the standard operating procedures for the activity and they will have had to do a site visit so they're familiar with the site that they're going to. Other supervisors, um, there might be some teachers involved, yep they'll need to have a police check because they have to have that for being a teacher. Uh, we might be going to use some volunteers. I've decided here that those volunteers, um, because of their access they will have to students um, the 
role I'm going to give them and uh, the amount of time. Um, it's not overnight. Uh, they have uh, no individual access to students that I'm not going to require them to be police che checked. That's a decision um, for your school to make. They don't have to be police checked as volunteers. Um, but over here in what induction and training they, those two roles need, uh, yep, they're gonna need to know about the site and they're gonna need to understand the uh, standard operating procedures for that activity. Um, I'm also gonna need a first aider. Uh, that could be the teacher or volunteer I've decided. Um, if they are a volunteer, because of the kind of access they might have and the contact with students um, in a first aid role, then I've decided that um, I'm gonna require that they are police checked. Again, that's a school decision. Um, and obviously they need a first aid qualification. They're also gonna to need to know about the site and the state and this, the SOPs for the activity. Now that first aider, you might decide that that's just gonna be the teacher in charge. Um, so you could put a tick up there, or you might decide it's got to be one of these teachers. You know, so there's lots of flexibility in here, but this is about identifying what roles you need to run that activity and the competencies that the people filling those roles need. Um, and you're not putting names to those at this stage. That the naming of those people would come when uh, the teacher fills out the intentions form and asks for permission from the EOTC coordinator or the DP or the principal, whoever manages that in your school, that's when um, that person would check that the people assigned or, um, to the different roles actually have the competencies that you've identified in this process. Uh, moving on down, you're not gonna know these things at this stage. Um, and you're also not gonna know the supervision um, structure for that particular event, because you'll need to work that out once you know the competency of the staff, uh, the particular group of students. Um, you might have students that need uh, teacher aid support and the conditions on the day, summer, winter, you know, that, those things all have different requirements um, and you need to consider them when you're um, deciding the supervision structure for that particular event. Um, any questions around the, this process so far? Swap over to the next stage. Okay, so once you've been through the risk assessment process using Form 2, and it's great to do that um, with a couple of people, um, that's the best possible um, practice. So you've got someone to run your ideas off um, and you know, it can be two people that are reasonably experienced, two or three people that are reasonably experienced in using that form. Um, that's a great way to go about it. And then what you're going to do is take the information and the thinking process you've used to fill out the risk assessment form over into the standard operating procedures. And in here, you're identifying and pulling over the things that are really significant and also having a whole lot of other information in there to really help guide um, that teacher um, run that activity on that particular day. Um, so if we just run through here and then I'll take some questions after we've had a look at this form as well. Um, so you can see I've created this for local activities, three um, very local parks and, play and a playground, um, in here I've popped what version it is, the date and when it's due for next review. You can have that in a footer, but it's really good to capture that on all of your documents. Um, and now I've got a section about what's going to happen prior to leaving in the planning. Now, um, if it's a particular activity um, you've got in mind, you can expand these things um, 
to whatever extent you want to. You might attach a whole lesson plan about what you're doing down there um, so that uh, you, know, you might be doing a weeding exercise um, and then some planting. You've got a whole lesson plan. You want every class that goes down to have um, the same experience and there's the lesson plan they're gonna follow. Um, so these can be expanded to as much or as little information as you want to guide what happens um, before the class um, goes out on their experience. There's a little checklist here around the, the really important things to think about and, um, and to have with you as well. Uh, so you know, this health information, uh, caregivers details, the role, uh, what you need to have and have checked before you leave. Uh, then what you do on leaving um, this school, they've got a wee, they have the intentions form filled out. Uh, on that intentions form, sometimes they have parents picking kids up straight from the site. So that has to be recorded on that intentions form. Goes in the box um, with the student list um, about who's actually going. Uh, and then they sign out and sign out on the whiteboard. When we get down to the major hazards, these are the things uh, that we've identified as really high risk um, in that initial risk assessment form. And we want to really highlight those as the important things to focus on for the teachers. And then the standard requirements help outline the really important things we're gonna to do to make sure we're addressing each one of these major hazards that we're gonna be we've identified as important and we're going to be making sure we monitor during that whole activity. Uh, when it comes to standard requirements, um, you can expand these and, and shrink them up to match the activity you're doing. So some things will need a whole lot more in here, um, other things will need, a, need less. It really depends on your activity, the age group you're working with, all of those sorts of things come into um, what you might do or what, what you might have in the standard requirements. Um, you know, the, the road crossing, for example, will look very different for the group of new entrants to the group of year 13s. Um, so this is all very modifiable. Um, and you can see there, it's just a, a nice simple bullet point list you could change it into checklists for some of these if you want teachers actually ticking them off as they go, um, either or. And it really outlines the important things that teachers need to do to run that particular activity. Uh, I've got a list of the, the safety equipment they're taking with them um, and a list of individual equipment that they're gonna check that their kids have before they leave the school. Um, obviously that can uh, be modified as well. So all of these things um, in black that we've looked at so far, um, you create off the risk assessment form and, and they are generic. Um, the teacher might modify them a little bit here and there, but they're basically the generic planning that you have already done for all of the teachers who will be taking those local activities. The teachers don't need to go back into a risk assessment form and do all of that work that you've done together as a little group of experts to start with. Um, and this form, the standard operating procedures would need to be reviewed if there was any incident or change. Um, but otherwise, if there isn't, then it could sit for um, probably up to a year and then you'd review it. So. Um, you need to have a process of review in place, but you don't need to be redoing it every time. What you do need to be looking at, or the teachers do need to be looking at every time, is this wording that it's in blue here. So they're gonna think about the participants they have on the day and what is particular about that particular group. Um, if there's, so this one, for example, was written for three different locations. Um, but for going to one of them, they need to consider um, with that age group um, and the route they're going on, there's something particular they need to consider about that. And also at, the, at their location was something they need to consider about that location. Um, and that might be one that 
it's different from a summer day to a winter day. That could be an example where you'd have something particular in that location box. Front of mind um, and the hazards on the day, those are, just as they say, um, the thing you really want to bring to everyone's attention. Um, so in this case, Bob's allergic to wasp stings. Um, you want everyone in the group or all the supervisors in the group to be really conscious of that. If you suddenly arrive down to the park and it's full of wasps, you want to know about that and that's going to change what you're doing um, then and there. So they're the things you really want to be thinking about on the day for that particular group. Um, here's just an example. You might have some particular contacts um, that you need for that event. Uh, and then here's a little site map. Uh, so this one's got the, the three different routes to take to the three different areas. Uh, we've talked about water in particular um, here being a hazard. And so it's, it's just identified. Um, it's just about making it really clear for everyone about um, where you're going and how you're getting there. And then the last thing on here is what you need to do on return. Uh, so the process for telling people you're back at school. Um, if this was one where you were coming back after school or, or a bigger school, you could have a process where the, you, know, you text someone to let, you know, let them know you're back. Um, completing an incident report if you need to, returning the first aid, noting any usage. That's really the expectations that you have um, when they get back into school. Uh, once it's completed by the teacher in charge of the event, so they've put the, changed the blue wording to um, make it for their group on the, the day they're going, and they'd put their name in here, the date, uh, whoever's in charge of approving that at school would do the same over here, their signature or name and the date. Um, and that's it. Um, so I'll just stop that one. So any questions at, at this stage before we... Not on the chat, but if some if anybody has a question, just uh, just unmute and ask away. It's not a it's not too large a group. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Oh. More of a comment rather than a question. Um, okay. First of all, I apologise for being late. I was caught in traffic, <laughs> um, but uh, I just come along at four o'clock and went sit in. I'm actually, actually quite um, confused as to how to do this, the, um, the, the SOP to make one up. Um, a lot of information is on the RAMS forms. So to go from a RAMS to a, a standard operating procedure, I find that difficult to do and approve because as an EOC coordinator, I don't, I'm not fully in knowledge of it as what the actual program is doing. For example, if it's a PE activity, um, and they're doing a camp. I might not be from the campsite, but the teacher in charge is. So the standing operating, operating procedures is fine for the teacher in charge, but not for me who doesn't know the campsite. So when I approve that, I find that difficult, um, which is why in our school, we get as far as doing a RAMS, and that once it's got RAMS approval, either by myself or by our board of trustees, it's, it stops at that point. And any other um, operating procedures taken by the teacher in charge, um, what are the ramifications around um, incidents when I'm not fully aware of, of the, um, the operating procedures? Ooh. Right, there's a lot in there, Gary. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, so standard operating procedures are definitely easier to develop for low risk local activities. So that's the first consideration. Um, if you're using an external uh, provider for your camps, um, they will have standard operating procedures for a lot of the activities they run. Um, but uh, going through, and there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with um, developing the risk assessment form and the super, including the supervision, that first form we looked at, developing that all the way to the end 
with all of the information on it for that particular activity on that day, and but using that. Janet, so, sorry, Josh, the, the risk assessment form is the same as the RAMS, correct? Yes, it's the new version of a RAMS form. So the RAMS oh. form um, doesn't have on it, unless you've modified it, the risk rating, the initial risk rating and the residual risk rating, which you're required to do under the health and safety new health and safety legislation. Um, right. So, uh, and also uh, historically RAMS forms are, contain a lot of information and important stuff can get missed just because there's so much on there. Um, and that's one of the advantages of SOPS or standard operating procedures is you're actually being really considered about what the really important stuff is. Identifying the stuff that's gonna um, really harm students um, and therefore is the most important thing to, for teachers to be aware of and to be managing. And it, and it doesn't get lost in um, the, the miles and pages of things that can be on a RAMS form or a risk assessment form that need to be thought about and considered, but aren't the things that are going to kill or maim a student. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think my concern is more around what might, yeah, I've got to roll this new, this new program in for my staff and it's going to be, change is always going to have to come up with resistance. So if I start asking, Staff to now produce a stop, um, which is a requirement. Um, it's going to it's going to be a lot of resistance to that. Yeah, no, um, a, a stop isn't a requirement. Um, it's a way to make staff staff's life easier. Um, right. And you would only, well, it's kind of key to consider when you're doing it. You what? Well, it's best to do for low risk local activities that happen all the time. Yeah. Um, or are run by a whole bunch of teachers and you want consistent practice across exactly. all of those teachers for that particular activity. Um, it's, it should reduce down the work that a classroom teacher has to do um, because uh, you'd want to do it either as the EOTC coordinator with the um, staff member, the teacher in charge, um, so you might have two or three people that kind of run and manage the camp, even though there's a lot of staff that go on a camp. So you could sit down with those two or three people and develop the standard operating procedures for that camp using the RAMs that you've had historically and then the risk is, and putting that information into the risk assessment form. Um, I'm going to see that a lot of information is available on some kind of toolbox available at Eon. Sorry, Gary, what was that? A lot of the information you're giving us now will be available on a toolbox for EONS? Um, it'll be available on EONS's website and I'll show you where um, the templates are. Okay, I'm going to meet myself now so you can carry the presentation, okay? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Sorry, Fiona, can I ask a question as well? Sure. So it's Craig Smith here. Hi, Craig. Uh, one of the things that I was taught when I did a lot of my outdoor training was that the, the most valuable part of, say, a RAMS or a RAF form was the actual thinking from the staff involved around the risk. And that was there to make them more switched on to those risks and thinking about how they were going to manage them and deal with them if things went south. By doing a SOP where most of the work's done for them, in terms of the risk management, is that kind of possibly taking away that layer of thinking around that risk management because they are not really sat down and thought about it in as much depth as they might otherwise? Good question. And I think it is uh, trying to strike a happy medium in there. Uh, for your high risk uh, outdoor activities, um, I think you'd find that you stay in the risk assessment form um, process and you uh, spend more time in there. You, the staff involved in those type of higher risk activities have a greater level of expertise around assessing um, risk and what those forms look like and how to pull out the important information and use them. Um, for the lower risk activities, for um, 
classroom teachers who we want to enable um, to go out as much as they can um, and deliver really high quality EOTC, but keep that um, safe. Uh, a SOP is a way of making that much easier for them to um, get their head around, but um, really identifying the important things to manage on the day. If that makes sense. I mean, the best practice is having as many people around the table developing the SOP as you could. So if you, um, you know, absolute best practice would be having anyone that's going to run that activity over the year, sitting around a table, working through the risk assessment process, and then taking that information over to a SOP with all of the other additional, you know, classroom information, what you're going to do there, why you're going there, attached to that as well. I mean, that's fantastic. Um, good practice planning. Um, but whether you've got time to do that uh, is another question and, and whether there's a happy medium in there that actually you take your expert risk assessors, they do that first bit of planning and then um, other teachers and the volunteers are looking at a much simpler form that they can understand. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I've got, sorry to take up your time, I've got one more kind of question for you. Yeah. We are, we're reviewing kind of the whole EOTC thing at my school and one of the things that's come up is not necessarily having a, an SOP for a, a specific activities like the example we gave a bit for kind of generic things like one of the things we've identified at our school is that the kids embarrass themselves and embarrass the school mostly if you would when they're doing dumb stuff around the the accommodation in a public setting yes when they're on camp or at sports tournaments and stuff like that so instead of having a SOP for a, a specific activity like the three park examples you gave would it be all right to have something like this is the standard operating procedures for accommodation yeah absolutely things when you're away on say, this winter sports tournament or something like that yep. Absolutely. And um, sport is a great example where SOPs are really useful. Um, you know, you could have a, and we used to have um, at my old school, an indoor sports SOP, an outdoor sports SOP, um, a local visit sports SOP, and a transport. Um, and I talked about the transport one and the transportation Zoom a couple of weeks or a month or so ago. Um, so it's those type of activities that happen all the time where you don't want to be um, doing a risk assessment form and the risk assessment form is too large um, and complicated for everyone involved in the supervision team to engage with. That's another way. So the answer, short answer, Craig, is yes. Yep. Okay. Thanks very much. Cool. Um, so just a couple of points to remember um, and um, it's really important that both the SOP, if you're going down that pathway of using a standard operating procedure, or the risk assessment form are just part of a package for an activity. Uh, they're, they're not the whole planning for the activity. So the package must also include um, the student information um, that needs to go with you the staff and volunteer medical information, and often that bit is um, missing, um, particularly around volunteers. Um, and that's the, the health and medical information that is relevant to that particular activity. Um, so you don't need to know your staff's life history, but you do need to know if they're a diabetic uh, and you're going out down to the park, have they got the medication they need with them? applies equally to students, staff and volunteers. Uh, and you also need your emergency response guide um, as part of that package. And that's really important for both the risk assessment form and that planning and for the standard operating procedures, um, that that response, emergency response guide is there, whether it's um, cut and pasted onto the end of the SOPs or um, risk assessment form or whether it is its own document. 
schools manage that in all sorts of ways. Uh, other key points, as we've already talked about, the um, risk assessment form and the standard operating procedures are both ways of communicating how you're planning to manage safety for that event. Uh, you don't, you wouldn't do them both for the same activity. Um, you use the risk assessment form in the planning process for SOPs, but then you don't use it again. Um, so you have a choice about whether you use the risk assessment form for the activity and that's what you share with the other teachers and the volunteers going that's what you use to talk to, about with the students or you use that tool to develop a standard operating procedures and that a standard operating procedure and that's what you use to talk about uh, with the other teachers that are going and with the volunteers that are going and with the students that are going and you use it over and over and over and over again um, you don't need to go back to the risk assessment form for the next time that activity runs. Um, any questions um, there before I pop off and just show you a couple of bits of the EON's website? Yeah, sorry, I have a um, question, Fiona. Sorry, I apologise. I'm just on a casual <laughs> stroll home. Lovely, um, Sandra. By my phone, but. Um, my question would be um, the pros and cons of a SAT, SOTS, versus it just being immersed within the EOTC approval. So does a, SOB, a SOTS, is the idea that that still gets attached in and goes through the approval process of the EOTC coordinator or whatever systems working within that school would be question one. And if so, the SOPS appears to be similar to what a RAS would cover anyway, except with the emphasis on the on the day checking by staff, because there's multiple staff going to be repetitively using that form of risk assessment slash management strategies and minimize, minimization strategies. So therefore, is there any resistance in terms of best practice about immersing it within the usual EOTC processes, but having a long standing time frame of dates. So for example, we currently have like a year nine trip that goes out and into a local primary school where they read to the primary school kids. And at the moment, the processes that they put in an EOTC form um, with the RAS form and that RAS form gets shared around all staff that may be doing that program in the schools and there's the emphasis on the on the day box and the needs of that day and the time frame is stamped for either the term or the year or that so it's sort of approved for on the basis of using this RAS and your team knowing what's happening um, we approve you essentially to go out using those management processes for that event throughout that window, throughout that time frame. Is that sort of okay? Or, and, and I guess that's where the pros and the cons of the, the standard operating procedures versus just a long standing EOTC application is my question. Yep. Uh, okay, so. Um, they, both of those things would be would be fine. So you could use a RAS, have a long date on it, um, and for those low risk activities, um, no problem. Um, or you could do the development process of the SOP um, using the RAS form and then just have your SOP and the classroom teacher would fill out the blue um, writing for their class and you'd have a long date on it and they just kind of need to be um, exactly the same as with the RAS form, some kind of um, understanding that if any health things came up during the term that they were somehow captured um, in that. Um, and I guess they would pop through on the um, classroom teacher's role anyway, on depending on what student management system you're using. Um, so yes, um, the SOP form 
um, could replace the RAMS for uh, the risk assessment form in the planning process that came through to you for approval. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And it, it's just a um, it's just a much simpler format and form um, for people or for teachers that haven't um, haven't had a long history of using risk assessment forms. Um, so it can really support teachers getting outside for those low risk activities. Um, but it's absolutely a school's choice, either or. Um, there's no compulsion whatsoever um, to have standard operating procedures. Um, if you and your staff are, are um, comfortable working, um, you feel you've got good understanding of the risk assessment process and putting those controls into place across your staff, um, just stay there, that's fine. Um, but if you can see activities that you do a whole lot and you think um, developing standard operating procedures for those, um, and in particular, local, low risk and sport, um, then give it a go and you know, involve your staff and see, see which system works best for them and which one um, they can really engage the most with, um, would be my advice. Um, so just a couple of things in um, here. Here's the homepage for the EONS website. Here's the big button for EOTC um, database um, registrations, and that takes you through to an information page. Um, up on the toolbar at the top is the EOTC management tab, where all of the things we've talked about today um, live. So if we go into here, uh, down the side, um, frequently asked questions are always good to have a look at. This is where the whole um, Zoom series sits, both the ones that are coming up and also the recorded ones that have been. So there's one in there around using um, the risk assessment form. There's one in there around transportation for students that has a standard operating procedure as an example um, of how you might manage transportation. Um, and I'm always after ideas about um, upcoming Zoom. So if there's something in particular um, that we haven't looked at um, that would be useful um, for you, please let me know um, and I can slot it into the, the series. Um, the next one is looking at um, systems for sports and supporting sport coordinators. Uh, and that's coming up next month. Um, also in here, this is where you find the most up-to-date current safety management plan template and the toolkits. So that's where this form uh, two, the risk assessment form and form three the um, standard operating procedures template um, both sit. And I would encourage you to look at those forms and see how they um, look compared to the forms you're using. Um, particularly if you're still in a RAMS um, space, I'd really encourage you as you plan um, activities going forward that you look at getting that information off your RAMS forms and over into a risk assessment form template um, that is the current template in there. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean you throw out all of your information off the RAMS form. You can, um, and it's really important that you take that learning and the information off the RAMS form um, because you've developed that over a series of years, hopefully, and through review, but just get it into that new um, template and then that will guide you around what the risk level is with no controls. And then once you've got your controls in, um, what that risk level then looks like. Um, so that's important for good practice. Uh, I think I've covered everything in there. Uh, so this is my email address down here. Um, any questions at, you want at any stage, um, if you would, um, we have at any stage, if you would like, to have a look at the two examples um, that I popped up today on local activities. Um, they're, they're just drafts um, and they are 
um, more generic than you would develop in a school where you um, know your students and the particular activities, but I'm quite happy to send those out um, to anyone. You can just flick me an email at that address and I'll send you um, the drafts out. Uh, so any other questions? Just one incident, well, I should say one question raised by my deputy principals um, regarding events that's particularly important um, with COVID lockdown procedures. With the, if we had another alert level three lockdown and we have an event where our, we have a group going out by an open area, I'm asking a question that can be answered by you, Fiona, or anybody else in the forum. Um, what would be the most likely procedure for getting our students and staff back to school if we are on an alert level three, for example, and there is no movement of traffic? Sorry, what was the very last bit of your sentence? If we were on alert level three, but the rest of, of New Zealand was alert level two, yep. and we were not, un we were unable to move because there is there is police um, checkpoints. Um, if we were in an event outside Auckland region and the lockdown, what would be the most likely process of getting staff and students back? Yeah. Um, it, for all the past lockdowns, um, you have been able to go home where, uh, particularly where you're going into a higher alert level. Um, yep. so I don't think you'd have a problem. Um, and you're also likely to have enough warning to get home. Um, so it would be a decision making process at the time, but um, I would suggest it would be likely that um, as soon as you knew there was an alert level change, that you would make a decision to um, stop whatever you were doing and get home as soon as you can. Um, and probably you're going to have time to do that before, between when they announce the lockdown and when the lockdown actually starts. And if you're going from level two into level three and you're going home, um, and particularly delivering students home, then you're there hasn't been a situation where you haven't been able to do that so far, and I would suspect it would be unlikely that there was one. Okay, I'm just thinking about an event where we're sending our group to clinicals next term. Yeah, clinicals could be that could be one or two days in the bush. Yeah, and having to get one or two days to get out in time for the lockdown, that would be quite difficult for them. Okay, this is a consideration. I mean, thanks for the um, response. Appreciate that. Uh, any other questions out there? Okay, if, um, if any questions come to mind or you would like um, to have a look at those drafts um, that I did and showed today, just flick me an email at that email address. Um, and again, um, thanks for attending today. And at any stage, you can flick questions through. They don't be, have to be related um, to what we talked about today, but it is best if they're related to EOTC management. Um, right, thank you very much. And hopefully we will uh, see you online again um, next month. Um, and also uh, look out and register your sports coordinators might be interested in being involved um, for the next one. And let me know if you think of any burning topics you'd like to discuss. Kia ora everyone. Thank you very much.